All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Luigi. Uh, so if you're watching this online or if you're present in this lecture today, um, I hope you're having a great day today. So um, today I'm going to lecture on making efficient responses. So I assume that all of you are here because you might feel that uh, you might be making inefficient responses right now. Um, so I, I guess before we begin, uh, I think I could just get a survey on the chat um, on what are some of the issues that you might be facing um, in making responses or making rebuttals or, you know, uh, in, the, in the moment during a debate, preparing uh, in prep time or going against another speaker, what are the specific problems that you are facing? And uh, I, I just want to get a survey for everyone so that I can understand uh, where we're going at. And I'm going to start sharing my screen afterwards so that we can begin. Oh, and yes, uh, we're going to try to be as interactive as possible uh, just to uh, make this session very worthwhile for everyone that's here. So there are some issues on prioritization. Some people are saying that it's an issue of structure. Spend too much time responding. I, I definitely have had that problem for a very long time. Disproving structural reasons. Yes, very difficulty. Very difficult. Uh, time management. Too much or too little. Yep, indeed. It's like a, looking for a Goldilocks position for whether or not a rebuttal is enough or whether you need to say more for the rebuttal or whether you should go into the argument or whatever. Some people are saying that it's a bit hard to focus on whether you should rebut the opening or the closing, especially if you're a whip. Yeah, I've been a whip for a while now and that's always been an important uh, consideration considering you have to you only have seven minutes right you prioritize one team leaving out the other two teams grouping content into specific rebuttals yep no i don't definitely agree so i guess one of the issues that has always boggled me and and, and this is why i chose this lecture or this topic in particular is that yeah Responses often get forgotten in debate uh, because it, it's either individuals are taking a bit way too much time spending on unnecessary rebuttals that are unimportant or people are spending too little time explaining the importance of many of the rebuttals that they're presenting, uh, which is why the reason as to why I entitled this lecture Making Efficient Rebuttals is because it's it's one thing to respond to an argument as if it's a chore or as if it's something you need to do, but it's another thing to entirely approach with a very clear strategy in mind that your rebuttals have a particular end goal of winning a round, proving a particular point, disproving a particular point or particular mechanism, and then leading it towards your case and leading it towards your team winning. So, so that's the reason as to why we need to be as efficient as possible. Because, you know, teams, the opposite side will give probably 28 minutes worth of content. And your opening will also give 14 minutes of content. Or, or maybe what, whatever team before you has given many minutes of content, but you only have seven minutes. So you can't literally parse through every single claim, every single point of analysis and debunk every single part of that. Because if you really think about it, it's impossible because if you're parsing through every point of analysis, you're repeating the points for the seven minutes and then you're going to add responses which add more minutes on top of that. Which is why it is inherently inefficient to respond to every single point. And it is impossible for you to think that you can always do that all of the time or at least for the entirety of a person's speech. So that's why it's important to be efficient, or that's the mindset we need to get into. Um, so, and, and the second issue I want to caveat before we begin is there's always this tendency to believe that we always have to respond and start making responses when the previous speaker start speaking 
and only during the speech in the middle. So we only have seven minutes to make our responses. When, when that's not true, if you're a whip, you're not making responses to closing opposition if you're government whip right at the government whip speech alone or at the opposition at the member opposition speech alone you're making responses immediately maybe when they raise a PUI or maybe in prep time if you've already predicted some of the arguments that they might give or perhaps if you know that there are better arguments opening opposition could have run that closing opposition can hijack so Making efficient responses is a plan that you already prepare for. It's a strategy you enter the debate with, and these are responses you have a clear mind to launch when you enter the debate. Um, and, and that's the best way to prepare for making responses. So you have some headline idea, you adapt it to whatever terminology or style or presentation the previous speaker would make, and then you deliver the responses that you believe are most important to deliver. So that's the only thing you're going to take away from this lecture. Then, then by all means, Daya, I hope you've already learned a lot. But I'm going to go into the lecture proper now. And then uh, uh, allow me to go into the finer details as to what I mean. So I'm going to start presenting my screen. Um, so yeah. I think this should be it. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is my PowerPoint, uh, making efficient responses. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to ask some questions in the chat uh, for all of you, and you can answer in the chat. And then we can uh, discuss some of your answers afterwards. All right. So the outline of this presentation will go as follows. First, I'm going to discuss some important reminders I want to give up or talk about. Second some notes on argument construction on the meta uh, today, so an approach, the framework that I want to give for structuring a set of responses. And then I'm going to go through a series of types of responses and the functions of response that I believe are very, very important to remember, which are responses that disprove, concede, mitigate, and flip. And then we're going to conclude with some, uh, some, yeah, some concluding remarks. Uh, on how we can summarize all of what we've learned today. But before that, uh, I want to give an exercise for everyone before we begin um, so that everyone can try and apply some of the things that we'll learn later on throughout this lecture. So I want you to remember this motion until the very end. And I'm going to present an argument. And then I want you to try and attempt to create responses for this argument. So. Uh, as you know, we're doing this in theme. Uh, and yes, the PowerPoint will probably be shared at a later point. Let's say that this motion is this, the info slide. The veil of ignorance is a thought experiment that details a hypothetical person before they are born. They have no idea of the traits that they will be born with, which means that they don't know the class, gender, sexuality, et cetera, the personality that they will achieve or what their future will entail. They only know of the conditions of the world, i.e. the technologies that exist, the cultures that people practice, that there is violence, etc. And the motion is, this house prefers to be born, <clears throat> to be born in a randomly generated Minecraft hardcore world. Now, I'm sure everyone here knows Minecraft. Minecraft's a very fun game. I encourage you to play it. And the hardcore mode is... Uh, put in for the intentions and purposes of if you die, you will not respond. So you only have one life. So this is very, very important to remember. <clears throat> Let's consider this motion. Let's consider this motion. Uh, you can take a picture of it if you want. Just remember the motion until the very end. Because again, this is very, very important. Number two. So that's the motion. That's the info slide. Now let's say government and, and you're in opposition government creates a preemptive argument. So, so they enter the debate knowing that opposition might make an argument that, oh, you might die in the Minecraft world. You only have one life, and that's a bad thing. So government is going to say, well, in both sides of the debate, if you live in normal Earth, you know, the world we live in today, you also have one life. You might die, and not, you will obviously not respond. And in the Minecraft world, you obviously will have the same fate of dying and not responding. 
So the preemptive argument government launches is this. They say, you are less likely to die in a Minecraft world. Their framing is, the preservation of life is the most important value in this debate because it is the precondition for achieving more opportunities for happiness. And they say that if we can prove that this person is going to not die for an extended period of time in this world, and the chances of dying are much less, then we win the debate. So then they give some structural reasons as to why this argument is true. They give three specific reasons. Number one, they say survival skills are relatively intuitive to learn. You just have to break a tree, create a crafting bench, you have to make a house, survive the first night, and then you're gonna easily survive the next few days. Number two, there is literally no possibility for disease, disaster, climate change, or any existential threat in Minecraft. Unlike in the real world, we're in, if you are born with a particular disease, you are gonna live with that disease for a very long time. If you live in a world with climate change, your world is going to die in the next 20 or 40 years, or conditions will be worse in the next 40 years. If you live in a world where there might be another pandemic, then you will also have another existential threat that might threaten your life in a daily basis. So the Minecraft world where you know you only have to rely on hearts and, and the hunger bars that you have, you are not going to have all of this. That's the second structural reason. The third structural reason that they might provide is, oh, after surviving the first night, every preceding night becomes easier to deal with. So you can get armor. Maybe you can get an elytra or special, uh, uh, special equipment. You can get better weapons so you can kill more mobs in the future. And you can have shelter, etc., etc. So after you survive the first night, the next few days, you can probably live for a very, very long time. And, and the structural reason behind this argument is you can live for a longer time because you will not age. And in the real world, you will age and you will have a definite period in which you will actually die. So I hope that you realize that these are three different reasons that prove the same argument. You are less likely to die in a Minecraft world. So I'm going to give you um, around three minutes to be able to create responses against this now. I, I want you to just um, think, brainstorm through it for the next three minutes, and then we're going to proceed with the rest of the lecture, because I don't want you thinking of it uh, while we're going through the lecture, and then uh, some ideas might come up by then. So um, take a few minutes on your own, and then we can uh, go on by then at that time. There was a request to go look at the info slide, so I'm just going to present that right now. So um, I think we can proceed. Um, I think we've given enough time for this. Um, we're going to revisit this at the end of the lecture and the presentation. So uh, just uh, wait for a moment. And uh, you can share your answers all later. I see that there are a lot of people already answering in the chat. I think we can answer this and address this at the end of the lecture later on after we're done with everything else. So uh, I, I think it's just important to start off by saying that you know no argument is perfect. So uh, there are many vulnerabilities of this argument in particular. So uh, what I'm asking of is to think of what is the most efficient way to respond to this argument, right? So you might have millions of responses against this argument, right? You, you can have many, many responses to say against this argument. Like you could nitpick every single detail all you want, but, but you know, you have seven minutes yeah? and you need to focus on the most important parts that you believe are most strategic for your case. And, and that, would, that would differ, right? This would differ depending on what your arguments are, because no response is ever going to be launched in the same way, in the same debate, against the same argument, against every other team. So uh, what I want to teach is not the exact response that you have to launch. What I want to teach instead is the approach and the framework in which you are going to create these responses so that you can eventually decide what are the best responses that you should launch uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so we started with that. Um, now we're going to go on continuing with the next parts. Some important reminders that I think uh, we should keep in mind throughout this entire lecture. First uh, is the mindset. Um, each and every response is an opportunity to forward your team's chances of winning the round. And remember, 
responses are both destructive and are also significantly constructive at the same time. And what, what do I mean by this? So re responses have the function of saying that if something is untrue or is unlikely to be the case, you know, it functions as any other material in the debate. It's like an argument. It is saying that because something is not true, you are also forwarding some idea that because it is comparatively more true, some other counterfactual on your side, then you would say that our argument is better or our case is better. So remember that arguments are just not meant to be broken apart. They're, they're meant to lead you to proving a certain case in your side, which eventually makes you win the round. Number two, arguments and responses are not meant to be evaluated in absolutes, but rather in probabilities. So you know, there's a common response that are always launched in debates, such as it, it's the not mutually exclusive response. You know, there's a response that uh, both of these parms are symmetric in the debate. It's going to happen either way, et cetera, et cetera. But, but remember, debate is never just as simple as saying that it will happen or not happen, or it is uh, going to always be as bad as this or not as bad as this. Uh, but, but the debate is always going to be centered around probabilities and likelihood. And like any argument is centered around likelihood all of the time. Because you're demonstrating that if we can prove that a certain outcome is more likely than another certain outcome, then we demonstrate that in the vast majority of cases, this particular outcome should have more moral worth of consideration in this debate. And therefore, we have to demonstrate that th because this is more likely to happen, our argument is more likely to be true. And that's why we win the debate in the vast majority of circumstances, which is why we should win the debate, right? So that, that is how you are demonstrating why emotion should fall or emotion should be supported. And so that's the debate theory part of it. And then lastly, my last caveat is like any other debate skill, developing responses comes with intuition, foresight, and practice. Um, because when I say intuition, uh, you eventually realize the ways in which people create arguments, the habits that people develop, and the ways in which certain responses are more persuasive than others. And that's why eventually later on in your careers or when you practice more and more, you realize that, well, I can run many responses, but I'm going to pick this response as the one that I want to do because it's the most intuitive and clearest response that I can launch right now rather than me sounding more overcomplicated in launching like eight responses against this one particular argument. Uh, for foresight, you might say that it's better for me to plan the pre-plan the responses early on in prep time because I can have a devil's advocate in prep time and saying that, oh, if, if they're going to launch this response, I can already launch this preemption. But at the same time, if they're going to launch this argument and this stance and this clash, then I'm going to respond with this type of argument and this type of response as well. And then eventually that comes with practice later on. Some notes on argument construction. Uh, Okay, so, so a lot of us here are familiar with the way debate goes nowadays. Uh, I'm not so sure if this is going to apply in the next 10 years or 5 years or even next year, actually. But there is a current meta or, you know, the most efficient tactics uh, available in debate, uh, wherein there is what we, you know, the, uh, an, an emphasis or at least an overemphasis on framing proving what is important, and also an emphasis on demonstrating that there are many structural reasons for something to be true or false. And my comments on that would be as follows. Number one, whenever you are looking or evaluating or tracking a particular argument, and this applies to whether or not you're a judge or a debater or responding to a particular argument, the underlying structure of the argument what makes an argument true should be distinguished from its presentation and framing, how it is presented to be important, right? Well, what do I mean by this? In an argument such as demonstrating that uh, we must implement a wealth tax, and then the argument is presented as the incredibly wealthy or the rich 
are a fundamental threat to democracy, you can have many reasons as to why this is true. You can say they have political control because they can bribe many individuals in Congress and they can fund their political campaigns. You can say they have economic monopolistic control because they own many multinational corporations which operate in many countries and have many equity investment funds and therefore they control many of the economic development of a country, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can say they also have a lot of media social control over the state because they can fund certain media organizations at the same time. So that is the underlying structure of an argument, what makes an argument particularly true, that they are a fundamental threat to democracy for these particular reasons. But, but remember, that's distinguished from the way it is presented and framed in the debate. Because it might be framed in the debate that uh, if we can demonstrate that uh, the wealthy are a fundamental threat to democracy, then that is why we should implement a wealth tax, right? And that is why a wealth tax is the only recourse for us to balance the powers of these individuals by redistributing this income to a vast majority of individuals, right? So the framing of redistribution is distinct from the framing of whether, from the, from the argument of it being a threat to democracy for political, economic, and social reasons. Again, again the, distinguish, the, dis, the distinguishing factor is important to consider because you don't want to get caught up all of the time in either of the two. You, want, you don't want to get caught up in all of the reasons. You also don't want to get caught up only with the framing. You have to remember which part is which. And whenever it's presented in a debate, usually it, it happens simultaneously at the same time. So you need to be able to parse through or deconstruct which parts are the framing and which parts are the reasons so it's easier for you to break it up later on. Because right? you know, when, when you're rebutting something, you need to know what you're rebutting. And, and the first step of knowing what you're rebutting is distinguishing what the framing is and, and what the reasons are. Having said that, my second comment is this. The structural reasons meta is an attempt towards creating multiple independent reasons to prove a certain claim. And the reason as to why I highlight the word attempt is that it because they're never always successful in demonstrating that the claim is true, just because they list many reasons. Right? You know, having a list is not a substitute for you know, analysis all of the time, right? It is just a way of presenting the argument. And then some people tend to do it by giving many reasons. And, and I, I agree with the meta, and I, I, I believe that this is a good step of debating forward because it, it is an attempt to demonstrate that an argument can be true even if some reasons are broken up, but other reasons stay, stay the same, stay, stay true. So for example, in the argument I gave earlier, the wealthy are a threat to democracy. Remember, that's the claim. I gave a reason of political, economic, and social control. Those are independent. If the if you are saying that they don't have political control, right? You can give a reason that well, many politicians have many other investors, anyways, right? That's one rebuttal against that particular argument, but it doesn't rebut the fact that they have economic monopolistic control over many corporations, and therefore they can have they can hijack the the way in which employment is structured, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or or, or the way the industry is structured. Neither does that rebut the argument on media control, which changes the political preferences of people through propaganda in the media, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in some sense, it is multiple independent reasons that prove a certain claim because you need to be able to, at least because you want to make a very robust argument to rebut all of it or rebut every single reason at the same time. But at the same time, it's still an attempt. It's still an imperfect attempt because remember, in some way, the political control is also reliant on the economic control, right? right? They're not perfectly independent. They are somewhat independent, dependent on each other. So for example, the having economic control and monopolistic control is also a reason in which that allows them to have political control and also social media control, right? Because if you have Facebook or a big tech company that is very, very strong, 
then they're also able to manifest and control the algorithms and the way in which people um, facilitate the, the news for themselves. So, so th th that is also one way individuals parse through that. Again, to reiterate, the, the, the main definition of a structural reason is just an independent claim or an independent reason to prove a particular claim. So, so again, for this particular argument, the structural reasons are there is political control, there is economic control, and there is social control. But again, I, I demonstrated that it is an imperfect attempt because there is also ways in which they are dependent on each other. And therefore, one of the ways we can target the argument is how they are dependent on each other, which is a mechanism of them exerting this control absent competition, absent regulations, or them being able to do this unilaterally on their own. So then once you've deconstructed that point, and then you've realized also that is what makes these arguments dependent on each other, and that's what the argument hinges on, you're able to rebut that particular weakness of the argument. And then you can proceed from there. So that's why the last thing I want to highlight is there are many parts of an argument, right? There are many, many multiple parts of an argument. But oftentimes, all of them are not equally prioritized by certain speakers. There are more important parts of arguments than there are other parts of the argument. So for example, um, again, um, if I were to give you a motion such as this house would, um, I guess, implement a, a tax on smoking, right? A, a syntax on smoking. You might demonstrate that there are many reasons as to why smoking is bad, right? You know, smoking is bad for all of these reasons, blah, 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 blah. But, but then you're going to be like, that is why we should ban smoking. And then that's why we're going to create a disincentive. So if you're the opposition side, you don't necessarily have to rebut every single reason as to why smoking is unhealthy. Because you're eventually going to realize that, yeah, of course it's unhealthy. There's no way to prove that smoking is healthy. You're not going to demonstrate that smoking is a good thing for people. I mean, in the healthy sense, right? You might demonstrate that smoking might be good for people if they can choose to do so. So that's why you're going to rebut the argument of whether or not the implicit framing of the argument of whether people should prioritize health at all is important, or whether you will rebut the argument of whether a tax does more harm than good, right? So in some sense, you're creating this argument that, that is clearly delineating what you should prioritize and what you should not prioritize in the debate. All right, uh, I'm gonna address that other question. Um, there's a question asked, uh, what should you focus on when responding on a claim or rebutting? Yeah, uh, what you should focus on because that's the point of this entire lecture. All right, so we now venture on to the framework that I hope to present. So again, I don't want to give a frame. I don't want to give like a template that you should use in every debate. I don't want to like make it a standard that everyone should always use. So again, this is always an approach. It is a general approach to how you should create responses. And this is what worked for me. It might not work for you. So you should just experiment and see whether or not it will help you. And this is what I would usually do. The first step that you want to be clear with is you want to be able to reformulate the material to be responded to, right? Uh, there's a very, very clear line that I want to be clear with here. I want to be clear here by saying that you are not obliged to literally repeat every single part of the argument because you're going to be wasting time. And the judge already had this noted down. It's very clear in their mind what the argument is, presumably. Or if it's unclear... That's why this is an opportunity to reformulate the argument in a very clear manner. And the tip here is that the more true to word and charitable you are, you know, that you use similar terminology, you summarize the responses and delineate what is the clear reasoning behind this that they present, the stronger potential responses that you can eventually make. So again, I'll give an example and then I'm going to demonstrate it through this approach. 
So you're in a motion such as, um, let me provide a motion such as, uh, okay, let's do, the, uh, let's do the classic debate on this house opposes organized religion. So if we were to approach the motion, this house opposes organized religion, and then government side creates the argument, well, we oppose the organization of religion in this particular way because it impedes the personal faith of an individual and the process in which they can achieve their faith and find it on their own because they shouldn't have an intermediary or a priest to be able to tell them what they should believe in or what they should not believe in, right? You want to be clear with it, right? You want to say at opposition, step one, government side created an argument on personal faith. Their argument was that uh, a priest impedes personal faith of an individual because they are dictating to them what they should believe. That's step one. You're reformulating the material they responded to in a very concise, charitable way, and you're not really misrepresenting the argument. You know, if you were to misrepresent the argument, your, your response would be, you, know, you would say, government side made an argument that all priests are stupid and people need to be able to believe on their own. Well, they didn't really make an argument that priests are stupid. So that's a misrepresentation of the argument. So you, you shouldn't really do, be doing that. Instead, reformulate the argument. You should say that they made an argument that priests have an incentive to dictate the faith to individuals, and therefore it impedes their personal faith. And that is a bad thing. Step two. Step two is... You want to now present the strategy in which you will respond to this argument. Now, remember, this is very clear, right? Like, there are many ways to respond to this argument again. You see the argument of um, impeding personal faith, right? You can respond by saying, well, priests don't really, priests will not really um, be that malicious. They don't always dictate to you what the faith would be, they actually convince you to join the faith. And that's why it's a free choice for a lot of people. Or, or, or you might even respond by making another argument that, well, in your counterfactual, it's very difficult to achieve personal faith as well because you don't have the help of another individual to be able to allow you to connect to God. So you want to be clear with your strategy. So for example, let's choose the strategy of, I want to choose the strategy of demonstrating that priests um, actively help you develop a personal faith and develop some connection to God more meaningfully. And then you will demonstrate that this is our strategy. We want to rebut it in this particular way. And if we are able to prove this to be true, then their argument is untrue, and that's why we win. So for example, in this motion, you would say, I will rebut their argument by demonstrating that Priests don't impede personal faith, but they actually help you in developing your personal faith. So then that's when you move on to step three. You're now going to develop the headline response and the supporting comparative reasons. You're demonstrating now, now I want to prove the headline claim that priests help you develop a personal faith instead of impeding your personal faith. And then you give comparative reasons. And then you might say the following. You might say, number one, um, priests are able to talk to a community of individuals and communicate a belief that is widely accepted by a lot of people, which reinforces your faith on this particular God. Number two, you might say that a priest goes through a robust significant many years of theology, some training and experience, and therefore they are credible institutions that are trusted by the public. And therefore, because of this, they are more likely to have a connection to God than other individuals. And then you might give a third reason in demonstrating that, well, a, a priest has an incentive to cater to the public because they want you to maintain in the faith so they will always communicate with you through rituals, through sacraments, etc., etc. 
So now you're giving three reasons as to why priests help you develop a personal faith instead of impeding your personal faith. They actually don't dictate what you will say. They allow you to find and discern what God is and who God is. And now in step four, and this is an optional step because sometimes you might not really need to do this. Uh, sometimes you, you, it might take a bit too much time, but if you do have the time, you might want to frame the response. So now that we demonstrated, and this is framing, framing is why this response is important. You will say that because we have now demonstrated that priests are able to comparatively help you develop a personal faith and a personal connection connected to a community of individuals, especially as is done exclusively through organization in religion, then we win the debate on personal faith. And if we win the debate on personal faith, we beat opening government's most important value and we co-opt it for our side. And that is why we win. So again, you're making explicit that the framing of co-opting their value works for your side. And that's why your mechanisms stand. And that is why you win. So again, you've concluded with the framing of the response. And then now you've connected it to your case. And then you can develop more arguments afterwards. So again, let me review the steps. Step one, reformulating the material to be responded to. Step two, being clear with what the strategy of what your response will do in the debate. And number three, providing the responses and the reasons that support this headline response. And in number four, if you have the time, you can provide the importance and the reasoning as to why this response matters in the debate. All right, so that is the approach to structuring a set of responses. And again, it's always about clearing up what you are responding to and how you are responding to it and what your strategy is and what your framing is for this particular response. Again, it's very, very important to be comparative here because you don't want to just give reasons in a vacuum. You want to be able to show us to why it is comparatively better or comparatively more likely on your side. So now we're going to move on to different sets or functions of responses that I believe are very, very helpful for every debater. But uh, just give me a moment to just drink some water. All right. I hope everyone's still doing good. Um, hope everyone still has the energy. Um, this should only take around uh, probably maybe 30 more minutes maximum. So we're probably going to be done by around, I think, uh, if you're in GMP plus 8, around 215 or something like that. So we're going to go through different types of responses that I believe are important to remember. Responses that disprove. So the function of this response is just to demonstrate that your argument is untrue. And, that, and because it is untrue, it shouldn't be considered in the debate. So for example, you want to be very specific with the extent of the disagreement that you have with the particular argument. And you want to be very clear with what specific part of the argument you are responding to. So here's a worked example. <clears throat> in the motion, this house supports the cult of productivity. And the cult of productivity is defined in the info side as follows. <clears throat> The cult of productivity refers to a set of norms where being continuously productive and busy in both your professional and personal life is seen as desirable and virtuous. Let's say that the argument of government side is absent the cult of productivity, individuals will be even more coerced to work overtime. <clears throat> and some of the reasonings they might provide would include there are capitalist structures, there are competitive incentives or social comparisons, <laughs> or there are other reasons as to why people are made to work overtime and overly uh, prioritize their work, which is unhealthy, and that's why it's bad for them. And that's why we need to be able to have the cult of productivity so that we can achieve this balance wherein you will be continuously productive and busy in both your professional and personal life. And that's why people can never achieve this balance absent the cult of productivity. So again, this is a very smart argument government might run because they're saying that, well, we actually agree that there's a problem with people working overtime, and then that's why it's a bad thing. 
So, so we're demonstrating now the cult of productivity is exactly what balances people's priorities. And that's why it allows people to help each other balance their work and personal life. And that's why it's going to be better for them in the future. And then they might give more mechanisms as to why this is likely to be the case. Like they might say that, oh, this is commercialized through different institution, institutions. This is going to be a social norm. So your friends and your community are going to help help each other to get better in your personal life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, and all of these things, right? And they might even say that there's a competitive incentive in the workplace as to why employers will encourage you to be more productive by balancing both your work and your personal life because of the cult of productivity. Having said that, you know, um, you might make a response. So individuals have natural incentives to pursue other forms of meaning in their life. So for example, you're now deconstructing the claim that, well, they, they, if the cult of productivity didn't exist, they won't be coerced to work overtime because they have the family, they have the hobbies, they have other things that are probably more important to them rather than, and then you're comparing, you're comparing here that, well, this is more important to them than maybe the competitive incentive they have to get the promotion. This is more important to them than the capitalist structure that makes them want to uh, go to work every single day, et cetera, et cetera, because they might be overworked and that they might not find that fulfilling. They might find more happiness in their hobby or their family. And that's why they might naturally gravitate to these other affairs. And then you might make the counter argument or the counter response that it is exactly the cult of productivity that enables this hyper work culture because it doesn't achieve the balance. And then your extended disagreement is that the cult of productivity may reward work but it certainly does not reward balance. And then you need to provide more reasons as to why it does not help balance, right? So, so now you're here, you're demonstrating that we can disprove this argument by deconstructing that it doesn't achieve the balance. It doesn't necessarily allow for individuals to be free of the coercion to work over time, but rather it is the cult of productivity that makes it harder for them to achieve the other forms of meaning that are more important for them, like the family, like the hobbies, et cetera, et cetera. And then now you're framing this response to be more important because now this is more approximate to the individual. It is more important for this person's happiness. And that's why the cult of productivity does more harm than good. So that is a response that this proves. So there's a question in the chat as a whip, what is the best strategy to do the response? So again, um, that is what we are tackling in this lecture. Um, there are many ways to respond to a certain argument, like this argument, right? There are many ways to respond to this argument, but, but one of them is to be very clear that now we need to target what is the most important vulnerability in this argument. The most important vulnerability in this argument is that it's assuming two things. One, that individuals will always work overtime absent the cult of productivity. And number two, it's assuming that individuals will achieve a balance with the cult of productivity. So now we need to deconstruct both of those things as the thing we need to rebut specifically. We're not rebutting the capitalist structure. We're not rebutting the competitive incentive or the social comparisons. We're rebutting the way in which the argument is structured to prove these assumptions to be true. So then we rebut those assumptions. And that's what's more efficient. Number two, responses that concede. So again, we want to be specific with the extent of the concession for this particular response. Because remember, a concession is only successful if it works towards your favor, right? A concession only works in co-opting a certain argument or a certain premise or a certain mechanism so that you can fulfill your argument. Because if you're co conceding a response or an argument that is bad for you, then, then don't concede it. You have to rebut it or respond to it in a different way. So let's give you a particular response or a particular example. Let's say the motion was, this house believes that it is in the interest of liberal opposition movements in authoritarian democracies to actively employ and embrace strategies of disinformation. And let's say the argument of government side was this. Government side says authoritarians have significant control and power over all branches of government. 
And they give reasons as to how this is true. In the executive, they have powers through the presidential veto and the military. In the legislative, they have powers through strong one-party majorities. And through the judiciary, they have power through appointments and therefore they cement themselves through the Supreme Court. Therefore, liberal opposition movements cannot contest them in elections. Instead, we can put fear into the authoritarian's control by employing disinformation. So again, uh, I want to be clear here. The, the uh, disinformation is just a strategy of providing um, false information online that ruins the reputation of other individuals. You know, and this can be done through fake news, uh, through done through social media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so now the definition is clear. The argument is just that we can put fear into the authoritarian's control by employing disinformation. And I, I think you can understand why this argument might be true because you know you're demonstrating that um, you can ruin the spheres of control of the authoritarian by saying that we can actively you know, give many corruption scandals or give many uh, uh, false information of ways that they are using the budget in bad ways to betray the trust of the public, or, or you know, you can create infighting between the military or infighting between certain people in the political party, and then they're going to squabble with each other, and then that's why this information actively ruins the power of this authoritarian leader, especially within a democracy. If you were opposition, one of the responses that could see might be as follows. You might say, yeah, we agree. Authoritarians have a lot of control. And since authoritarians have so much control, this also enables them to put liberal opposition figures in jail because even the prospect of being affiliated with this information might cause them to be preemptively put into jail and be preemptively taken out of political positions. And then you actually might make an argument that says, because the fear exists precisely because of fear, it is why disinformation actively worsens any social movement or any opposition movement entirely, right? So your extent of the concession is as follows. You con concede to the conclusion of fear, but not necessarily the claim that liberal opposition movements cannot contest them in elections. You might actually say, that contesting in elections might be unimportant in the debate. So we don't really care about the conclusion. You know, we, we agree. You know, sometimes they might lose on both sides. We don't even know they're going to win all the time. Maybe it might be a different party that wins. It might not be the opposition movement. Or you might even make an argument that says, maybe we might want to cooperate with the administration and worsen the worst excesses of it. So, so again, those responses and those stances might be very different. And it depends on your strategy. But the concession still remains. You will still say that the fear that this puts in the authoritarian puts more harm on these movements. And therefore, the fear and prospect of being affiliated with this information already causes harm to everyone in the liberal opposition movement. And that's why everyone is going to be put into danger for being imprisoned, and therefore, their life is going to be at stake. And that causes a guaranteed harm to many individuals as opposed to a speculative benefit that government might give. So again, that's the framing for the response that this is more guaranteed as a harm rather than the speculative benefits on their side. So again, I hope it's clear that you're being very, very explicit with the way in which you are responding to the, how this argument, right? Um, how do you rebut the rebuttal? when you are rebuilding. Um, so again, um, so that's a very good question. If you were government side in this debate and then opposition launches this particular response and then you were running that argument to begin with, you might make an argument then by saying that, well, now that opposition has made the claim and they've conceded to our fear mechanism, what matters in the debate is whether or not this gives more leverage to the opposition movement or less leverage to the opposition movement. So now we are going to make the argument that this actually gives more leverage to the liberal opposition movement because the mechanism of disinformation, and then now you're adding another layer to the argument, which actually responds to the rebuttal by saying that now 
because this information is difficult to track and it is anonymous. It comes from multiple sources at the same time. And we can even, even force the authoritarian to think that individuals, even within his own party, are trying to betray himself, then that's why you weaken the authoritarian's control in general. And that's why he can't also, at the same time, imprison and have the political will to imprison many opposition figures. So government might make the counter response in saying that now we might not have a liberal opposition, but we create a broader, stronger coalition across multiple parties to oppose this particular authoritarian. And that's why this is a particular guaranteed benefit on our side of the house. So I hope, I hope you understand why this is a different response from the initial argument, because now you're saying that, now we're saying, instead of just dividing the movement, we are actually creating a broader opposition that is stronger than opposition's opposition. And that's why we're able to use this information to be able to help our cause. So that's why it's good. Right? And that's why you, you'd eventually go back and forth on whether this likelihood is true or not. And then opposition will respond again on likelihood, and then the debate happens. You know, that, that's debate. Next example. Responses that mitigate. And I want to be clear for everyone that's watching and anyone that's present right now. A response that mitigates is not always bad. Right? Then, Responses that mitigate can be very, very effective. They can be very, very persuasive. They can also function just as meaningfully as any other rebuttal or as any other argument. So if you run into a mitigation, you have to prove why it's important. So my tip here is you want to be clear with the implications of the mitigation. Because remember, what is the normal criticism people will have against mitigation responses? They'll say that, well, it only mitigates the argument, but it doesn't completely disprove it. But the argument still stands. But, but the point of a mitigation is you want to say that because we significantly mitigate the argument so much that it takes away the value of the contribution and the conclusion at all, then the argument shouldn't be considered. So for example, let's say the motion was, this house believes that religion is incompatible with social development. So again, it's a very broad motion. This house believes that religion is incompatible with social development. And let's say government launches an argument. Religion is inherently coercive. It indoctrinates followers to dogma that is counterintuitive to social development. And you might say things like, uh, uh, you might give examples like the it caused the AIDS epidemic it, it, by denying contraception to a lot of individuals because of the pro-life stance that people took. Uh, and, and you might give many reasons as to why indoctrination is likely. Like For example, you're indoctrinated at a very young age and therefore you cannot contest your parents. Um, you might give examples that because you're in a community that's an echo chamber, you cannot see other perspectives outside of it, et cetera, et cetera. And let's say you're responding to that argument. So again, you want to be as efficient as possible. What is the response that mitigates this impact? You might say that religion is not inherently coercive because there are, A, then you might give reasons. A, there are competing religions. B, there are incentives for religious institutions to evolve with modern day social values. And C, there are incentives for social organizations to appeal to multiple religions at the same time for more resources. And you might say that, well, yeah, uh, yes, you might have indoctrination, but it's not inherently coercive such that people will be blindly following the religion all of their lives. People ultimately become more reasonable. They opt into religion and they find meaning and fulfillment in the religion and they enjoy the religion. And, and so, you know, people are not completely blindsided. And therefore, I am, am mitigating the argument that they are not inherently coercive. They don't always make people follow dogma that's counterintuitive to social development. And therefore, the implication of the argument is that it proves that followers are not unwillingly opting into dogma and that it may or may not be harmful for them. And because the argument is dependent on it being inherently coercive, 
and people determining what social development is for them personally in their lives, then because religion is another facet of their identity and it is also meaningful and provides them happiness for them to opt into them meaningfully, just as any other choice can also be just as coercive or as not as coercive as this, then that is why it should be not inherently incompatible with social development. And that is why it can actively also do good for a lot of these individuals. So you're now demonstrating that now because we mitigate the argument on coercion, and it's not, you know, you're not saying that it's always going to be a free choice. You're just saying that it's going to be not always inherently coercive. And there are many instances in which it may not be harmful to them. Then you're mitigating the argument to the point in which that it is enough for you to say that this is the tipping point to demonstrate that it is not incompatible with social development. And that's why we win, right? So that's the framing for the response. So, so this is one response that I think is very, very powerful in demonstrating that if you are clear with the implications of the mitigation, rather than just saying the mitigation in general, you want to be able to demonstrate how this helps your case or how this helps your impacting for the debate. The last type of responses I want to go through now are responses that flip. So these are responses that would spin an argument for your, for your side. So you're saying that, well, well, your argument is not an argument for your side. That's an argument for our side. And that's why we win. Uh, and, and there are many ways to be able to demonstrate how you can spin an argument. Because you know there are many parts of the argument that you can spin. You can spin a premise. You can spin an analysis or a mechanism or whatever. But my tip for avoiding unnecessary contradictions is to flip the mechanism, not the general argument in its vague entirety. So for example, if there's an argument like, oh, we save people, you're not spinning the argument of, well, we also save people. No, that's, not the, that's not the spinning. That's not really a spin or a flip. What you are flipping is that a specific mechanism that leads for people to save people. And then now you're saying, because that mechanism works for our side, or that analysis works for our side, then we can co-opt this and that's why we win. Or actually, you say that it's exclusive for our side and that's why we win. So for example, the motion is this house would impose a carbon tax on individuals. And let's say government runs an argument, which is a very reasonable and intuitive argument of imposing a carbon tax will likely encourage individuals to opt in to greener and more sustainable options. And, and the mechanism they have for this is a higher tax, which is the carbon tax in this case, causes divestment from carbon-intensive activities and products. So for example, they might use a car less because they are going to be taxed more for paying for gasoline, et cetera, et cetera. And they might opt in for a greener, more sustainable option, like, I don't know, using public transportation or biking or whatever. Or it might, maybe for the more wealthy, they might eventually buy an electric car or something like that, right? One of the responses, again, I want to be clear, this is just one of the responses. One of the responses that might flip this argument might be, you know, we agree. We agree that this mechanism causes divestment from carbon-intensive activities. And you might make the argument that this incredible shift in demand will cause significant unemployment from carbon-intensive industries, worsening the development prospects for the developing world and opportunities for the working class, such that if the incredibly wealthy or the middle class or upper middle class are the ones that opt into greener and more sustainable options early on, which are the ones who are more likely to pollute or use these carbon-intensive activities otherwise, then you are harming the most vulnerable actors in these states who are reliant on carbon-intensive industries and who cannot find a sustainable job in these other industries which have less employment options. So for example, you know, industries such as mining, industries such as um, 
yeah, like uh, working for certain oil companies or working for certain factories in textile industries, et cetera, et cetera, which are very, very intensive on water or carbon. Um, these are industries that people rely on. And therefore, the short-term implications of this carbon tax causes substantial damage to many of these economies in these states, disabling their capacity to help these individuals entirely. So you might concede to the argument and saying that, yeah, I agree, your carbon tax helps some individuals go to sustainable options, but because it causes significant harm, we flip the argument in your mechanism, and that's why we win, because it makes substantial damage for a lot more people. So I hope the argument makes sense that you're now flipping the mechanism and saying that that is why it is bad. <laughs> so because of this mechanism, that is why it is bad. And then the framing is, uh, this is this harm is more important than their benefit because we believe we're catering to more vulnerable actors. And you might have different ways that you might want to frame that response. So these are responses that flip a certain mechanism or a certain argument. All right. We have now reached the end of our presentation. And now I just want to end by going back to revisit our Minecraft example earlier. Um, uh, just to answer the question of one person, um, you, they're confused as to why they can't just work for less carbon intensive companies. And the reason as to why this is true is that you might give arguments such as, well, the transitionary costs might be very, in, very difficult, or you might say that the green technology industry or um, other industries that don't rely on natural resource extraction just don't rely on having a lot more people. So for example, maintaining um, solar farms or other types of uh, green technology industries just simply don't rely on um, labor-intensive industries and comparatively rely on more automated industries. And that's why it's more likely to disenfranchise a lot more people in the short to medium term. Uh, and, and that's why people are not like going to have the skills to enter into these industries in the first place. So, so then you demonstrate that because of these particular harms, it, it's very, very difficult for them to enter that. But, but again, that's debatable uh, and, and uh, th that might change uh, depending on the debate. All right. So now we're going to go back to the Minecraft example that we provided earlier. Um, I guess now is a good time for people to re-put or re-input their answers in the chat. I'm going to go and free flash the slide. Um, but if you have your answers prepared, uh, go ahead. Uh, you can already um, put it into the chat. Uh, and then we're going to address some of these things. So again, the argument was you are less likely to die in a Minecraft world. The framing was preservation of life is most important. And then there are some structural reasons, survival skills, disease, surviving every night, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to give a few minutes for you to all copy paste it in the chat or whatever, or type it in the chat, and then I'll be back. All right. So I'm going to parse through some of these responses. We have a lot of good responses that I think are pretty funny, actually, and they're very entertaining. We have a lot of Minecraft haters in the chat. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through some of these responses now. All right, so some of the responses are saying that uh, the premise of GOV is that you actually survive the first night when most people actually tend to fail the first night. This is furthermore likely if everyone is born knowing that they have to survive the first night and they fight over resources, and that's going to be a bad thing. Um, comparative is that the first part of our lives are relatively easier. I guess it's because of parenting and this is offering a more level playing field even for those who are slower to develop, but also people don't fight over resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other individuals are answering, you, you know, you don't know the structure of the game like crafting, therefore it's harder to learn. So that's a rebuttal against survival skills. Um, and you're going to be alone. So you don't have people to learn from and that's why it's going to be bad for them. Um, other people are saying we can contest the framing and say that since they want is to achieve more opportunity for happiness, we would get that in the real world. There are more choices as to what you want to do in the real world than there are in Minecraft. Um, might be true. That's debatable, definitely. Um, one person says dying is symmetric on both sides. At the first place, when you are bored, you are not capable to defeat those zombies which are in Minecraft world. Yes, that's correct. Even if you get the weapon for a child to use, isn't that practical when a child is unaware about the world itself? Correct. Other people are responding for the disease point. Um, 
these are issues that are being tackled fairly well in status quo, advancement in technology and medical sciences. That's correct, actually. People are definitely improving the world as it is. Definitely true. Um, survival skills are going to be learned in very risky ways, which are very, very harmful to people. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. Um, argument only stands if you're Steve Alex. I mean, the, the, that's up to debate or that's within the debate, as people would say. Um, doesn't account for psychological stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, quality of life is low for the average skilled player. Argument is contingent, blah, blah, blah. Is always the case. A birth lottery still exists, and that's why it's bad. Um, Minecraft doesn't have diseases nor disasters, but by virtue of being a hardcore world with relatively primitive technology, you're more likely than not to die from starvation or from mobs, as correct. Um, yes, you call them mobs in this game. Uh, you might even die from Technoblade. Uh, Minecraft is more dangerous than in the real world because the nether exists. Also, the end. Yes, that is also correct. Thank you for the specialized matter. Um, also, reframe the higher chance of survival doesn't equate happiness. Yes, that is also very, very nice. Um, that higher chance of survival does not mean that you have a better life. Does not have, mean that you're going to have a more fulfilling life, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, all of these things. Um, other people are saying the reality speaks for both worlds. Resources are scarce, the demand is over increasing. You know, to be fair, the resource scarce point, I actually don't agree with that because Minecraft it's infinitely generating and the world is not infinitely generating. But I don't know. It's, uh, maybe that's up to you. <laughs> don't worry, that's the joke. Uh, other people are responding that um, there is an absence of skills that are not relatively related to survival, like recreation. Yes, that's also correct. Um, definitely really nice, important responses. So. I think it's very intuitive that if you're looking at this argument, that you might want to see what are the ways in which you can make a comparatively better counterfactual at all. So I remember, remember the approach. You want to reformulate the argument and be very clear with what you are particularly rebutting. So for example, you would demonstrate that, well, a lot of the assumption of this argument are as follows, right? So number one, it assumes that Having this survival equates to the ability for you to achieve more opportunities for happiness. And the second assumption that is also embedded within the argument or within the structural reasons, and this is what connects these reasons against each other, is that because you are able to survive the first night, every other night becomes easier to deal with and that you will survive the first night because everyone is going to learn this all the time. So reason one or reason three is dependent on reason one. And in some way, um, reason two is also dependent on the fact that um, the comparative is just going to be worse and worse and worse all the time, rather than Minecraft, which is already very terrifying to begin with. right? So in some sense, yeah, you can, you can concede with this point that climate change, disease, pandemics might be possible. But if we can mitigate that and significantly reduce the chances, then this is an important response that debunks that point. The other two responses, we just have to debunk the point that the survival skills are not likely to begin with, and therefore it's going to be worse for the potential for you to survive. But then the other strategy you're responding is that the preservation of life is not the most important thing. So how would I respond having said this? The way I would respond is as follows. There would be three strategies I would implement within this. The first I would say, I would respond to the framing. And this depends again on your stance. I would say, merely preserving life is not important. If you can demonstrate that every day of living in a Minecraft hardcore world will be life depleting and horrific for the average person. You know, so every day having to be in isolation, having to interact with multiple mobs at the same time that may kill you at any single point in time, or um, the potential for you to accidentally fall into a lava pit or whatever, are all ways in which you will be at the precipice of death every single point in your life, which is not going to be a, me, a way for you to experience happiness. And it's also not a way for you to experience many meaningful, fulfilling ventures that might be good for you as a person. Strategy two, I might demonstrate and break down the reasons. And you might say that it is most likely that you will die on the first few nights in Minecraft. And there are many reasons as to why this is likely. You know, this, this is the point wherein you are most vulnerable. This is the point where you might be randomly generated into a, a pitfall, or you might be, or, or you might 
uh, not break a tree in due time, or you might not know how to break a tree, or you might not know how to craft a sword or a pickaxe, or, or a, a creeper might just come behind you and explode. And therefore, because we are able to prove that you will die in the first few nights in Minecraft, it already deconstructs reason one and reason three, or even reason two, because you know, disease and starvation, at least they're comparatively better to deal with in the long term because people won't die immediately from this all the time. Or strategy three, you might demonstrate and flip the best case interpretation of the argument, which I think some of you guys were leading to when you were responding earlier, that immortality might be worse than living an average limited life on Earth. Because remember, the argument was also about eternity and also aging until death. And in Earth, you're likely going to die when you're age 80 or around 80 or 70 or 80, 90 or whatever. Whereas in Minecraft, if you will have the best life or the longest life possible, it might not be a very good life or it might not be a fulfilling, happy life for a lot of people because you might not have the experiences that you can compare that can be as meaningful as any other day that you might have had in your life. Whereas if you can have the ability to retrospect, reflect on your life with a limited time span, you're able to do comparatively more meaningful things because you know that life is not going to be immortal. And that's why it's better for you to flip the argument on that way. So again, there are many strategies that you can employ. It depends on your strategy and opposition. Because uh, you know the motion is very broad and, and there are many ways to do it. So um, these are just some of the, uh, as you might call it, some tools in the toolkit that you might use. Some concluding remarks um, as we end this lecture. Um, thank you again, everyone, for um, attending. Uh, there's one last question that was also asked. How do you avoid case shifting and burden shifting whenever you're responding extraneously? I know it might be out of the context of the workshop, but it would help for a lot for those like me. So again, my, my uh, so this is the question of whether or not you might contradict yourself if you're running multiple responses. And my tip is you want to be efficient. You want to, you want to choose only a few responses. You want to choose the most important response that you think is intuitively good. And there's no easy answer to that particular question because you need to practice and you need to have intuition and you have to have foresight for how you know which arguments sell more to the judges or which arguments or which responses don't sell as much in debate. Uh, and, and, and this is my tip. Some concluding remarks I might say would be as follows. There are exceptions where you will need to respond to each specific structural reason. So sometimes the strategy of collectivizing and showing the dependencies between structural reasons might not always work. But, but again, it's very, very, very rare. I, I would wager it's probably like around 1% of debates whenever it happens. Um, so um, I, I would still advise you to still think about the difference between the presentation of the framing of the argument and also the underlying structure of the argument. Because remember, no argument is perfect all the time. So you always want to respond to every structural reason and then uh, and, and, and track every reason and then summarize in an efficient way afterwards. Some fun ways that I'd like to practice more efficient response would be as follows. Um, again, you, you see this all the time, but I just like reiterating it because it's very, very helpful because it's the grind, you know. Record and repeat the response portions of your speeches watch debate videos and actively participate in creating responses, learn from your opponents and build habits to discern the commonly employed strategies in responding. And remember, efficiency is not is judged on the ability of a response to weaken and or strengthen your case for winning a round. It is not based on speed running. You don't need to download a Minecraft speed running client for you to be able to be good at responding. And you don't need to speak fast to be able to be efficient you just need to choose the most important responses that are crucial for the round. Because, you know, there's always a trade-off between speaking fast and not being understood or not being tracked all the time. So you always want to be very clear with imp the implications of every single response or at least the most important responses that you think are going to be considered at the end of the debate. Because if you're going to say a response that you don't think is important, then you might not as well say it, right? Because if it's not going to be important for winning the debate, then you're not going to need to be able to run it because it's not going to help you in the debate. So that's why I, I just really want to emphasize that treat responses as any other part of the speech that is very, very crucial for whether or not you win or whether you lose. Um, 
Uh, so there's a question on where can I learn more about structural reasoning? Um, I would just recommend that you look at any argument construction um, lecture. Because remember, um, structural reasons is just a term. It's just a term that just means reasons that are structural. And it's just a term that people use to create multiple independent reasons. So remember, it's just the structure of claim, reason one, reason two, reason three, which are independent. And all of these reasons independently prove the same conclusion, which is conclusion, conclusion, conclusion. So um, inevitably, uh, it's just analysis. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's just one way in which people format and collate these responses against themselves. So we've reached the portion wherein uh, we can, I can now answer questions. Um, so that ends our presentation. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm now going to continue to answer questions as we proceed. And I'm going to read out um, many of these questions as well. So if you have anything, you can... Oh, go ahead, Suresh. Go ahead. Um, Suda, you stop the recording? Uh, no, I can answer some questions during the recording as well. Uh, uh, sure, as sure. well. No worries. So there are some other questions that were also asked. Um, can you tell us some tips to be efficient as a whip when responding? Um, well, well, again, my, my tips would be, well, again, uh, other than everything I've said in the lecture, uh, my tips would include, um, you want to have a separate paper for take, tracking every single argument in the debate, like not only the label, uh, it, there's a temptation for you to only write the label of the argument. I don't write the label of the argument usually. I write down the mechanism, the, the important, most important reason for this argument. And then what are the implications and framing of the argument? I, I really make sure that I delineate which is which part of the argument when I'm tracking the argument while I'm a, while I'm a whip. Um, because what I really do is um, I, I spend all of the first two speakers just writing down notes of every other person's speech and then my thoughts process. And then later on in the debate, that's when you're going to have the exercise of Okay, I can organize this response here. I can organize these sets of responses to respond to this type of chunk of argumentation. And then I can demonstrate why this response responds to this, 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 and then et cetera, et cetera. And then that's really what the whip does eventually. Not related to the topic, but what books do you recommend to read to boost the inference critical thinking of the viewers and attendees today? Um, well, I don't really recommend uh, reading, uh, um, like uh, if it's just about inference and critical thinking, uh, I recommend um, watching debate videos. That's very fun. I, that's how I learned a lot when I was younger. Um, some other things that I also recommend uh, in uh, the topic would be like um, just reading for fun, honestly. Like don't read to... Um, learn for debate i you just read to absorb the world you know you want to be a sponge i make my social media algorithms tailor fit to debate and news stuff and just because like i've enjoyed it and it's my lifestyle and it's how i want to become a better person um so if you really think about it all the time and you really just make a lifestyle around wanting to be more knowledgeable about the world and seeing how models interact with each other and how frames interact with each other in the real world then, then, then the arguments just feel more real to you and it, it, it becomes more meaningful. So what I do, I, I just have fun, you know. <laughs> I also play games. How would you structure your response when dealing with different teams in BP as a whip and how does it differ from GovWhip to OpWhip? I'll answer the first question. Um, when you deal with different teams, what I do is, um, so first, I want to be clear with what are the parts that they share and if they have parts that they share, I want to be clear with what are the parts that were done better by a team and what are the parts done differently by another team? Because you just don't want to say that like, oh, they're, they're the same argument and then they're a rehash and you, you don't respond to them. You want to say, what did they specifically differently contribute in the argument and how do I respond to that particular part? And then what are the parts that I will credit to opening and then I will respond to that particular part? And then I'm going to say, okay, Having said this, what is left standing from closing team? And then I'll respond to the other newer conclusions and then delineate and parse through what are the parts that are that are uncomparative or what are the parts that I 
that are more that are less relevant than the stuff that we introduced on our side. How does it differ from GovWhip to OpWhip? At GovWhip, um, I spend significantly more time um, parsing through the closing opposition case um, because you know I'm the only time to respond to it. So I, I really spend some time thinking like, uh, what what is each and every mechanism? What is each and every response? I, I'm a bit more disciplined with closing op opposition. Um, at OpWhip, I, I take a more holistic approach at least uh, because I, I want to be clear with why our case fits with the rest of the debate and so we don't get boxed out. That's usually what I do. Um, but again, it differs per debate. Um, hello, I just want to ask, how do you make an argument fall if your opponent provided several structural reasons? Do you need to respond to all of them in order to win the exchange? Again, as I've uh, presented in this lecture, you don't need to respond to all of them in order to win the exchange. Sometimes you might want to um, summarize some of these responses and show the interdependencies between some of these structural reasons. So, uh, for example, in the example I provided earlier, uh, let, me, let me give that response. The survival skills is also interdependent with the reason C. So you want to be able to not respond to every single point, but you want to just demonstrate why some of these are interdependent, and then you respond to the interdependency. Um, as a first, sometimes it's really hard to attack the main claims of government's arguments. In those instances, what do you recommend to attack first? Should I mitigate impacts or give a subpar response either way? My response to that is, I don't think you should give a subpar response. I recommend that you um, find a way to... So, so this is where we venture into the part where you integrate responses sometimes. So again, uh, it, it, it's very important to be clear when you integrate responses or when you don't. But I want to be clear here in demonstrating that it only becomes integrated at the point in which you're becoming more and more comparative and building as you go along. So, so you, it, it's, it's, if, if government has a claim which you oppose with an argument, like, you, like they say, we save lives, and then you say, no, you kill lives, obviously you're, you, you're going to integrate your response to your argument. And then you want to demonstrate how does their responses and their reasons interact with our reasons? So you want to evolve the debate now as early as possible into making it comparative. So that's the most efficient way that you can attack it rather than you be being like, you know, subpar with certain responses and then giving another argument later on when you could have just combined the two and then become more efficient through it. Is there any way in which you respond differ based on speaker roles? would be great if you could say it for world schools. For world schools, um, well, my recommendation would be that because responses are more, you know, they're, they're like, it's, it's, it's one or the other, right? It's like, it's either gov or op or proper op. The, the best way, in my opinion, that you would respond to this is that you, you want to, you, you want to, you want to keep on emphasizing how a response has evolved and how a response has been tracked. That's the most important tip for Asians and world schools, in my opinion, because um, the response doesn't always stay the same throughout all speakers. Like There might be a preemptive argument, but then the response might change after LO gives their argument at DPM. And then DLO provides another argument, another response, another response. What's very, very important is demonstrating whether or not certain responses were enough to outweigh the other responses' responses to another response. So, so that is how you differ through each and every speaker role. You want to be very wary how each response evolved the case because you don't want to give up and drop your first speaker. You want to be able to show how either your first speaker preemptively responded to theirs or how your response evolved to respond to their argument as well as the debate evolved, as the debate went on. So that's the most important thing that I recommend in, in that format. How would you recommend structuring the intro? Things you want to say, clarify that aren't responses, then moving into responses. Um, well, honestly, um, I just write it down in full sentences. Uh, I, 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 I make it as short and concise as possible. Um, if I have a clarification at the beginning of my speech, I want to be clear with, well, guys, let's be clear. This debate is about blah, 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 blah. 
this clarification is very, very important for this debate because, and then you say blah, 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 because you want to be clear with saying that if I have this introduction, if I have this clear point I want to make at the beginning of my speech, it has a reason for being important. And because you don't want, you don't want to just do it for the flair. You want to do it for some, some logical basis that is grounded, that the judge can hold on to, that they can, that they can keep with. So, so that's my most important recommendation for structuring that. Another question is how can we maintain time for every response given that we can cover given that we can cover as per our strategy? Um, well, honestly, for in my opinion, um, if you are implementing the strategy, it should already be efficient. But if you want to shave off more time after that, my recommendation is. It really, it's it's just an it's an exercise in language at that point. It's really an exercise in um, being very very concise with the words you are choosing, and also um, being very clear with the implication of every response. Because remember, our, our, our the, the habit that people tend to develop in debate is that they might repeat the response, the same analysis point, many many multiple times throughout the speech. So you might say the same premise at the first response and you repeat the response again when you're rebutting another argument later on. So you might want to be more stra strategic and chunk it all together and then say how this response already responds to blah, blah, blah. And then that's why it's already effective from the very, from the very beginning. Um, and then, then you can build more as to why this is important for the debate. So that's my recommendation there. All right, I think I have answered all of the questions that have been asked to me in direct message or in the chat. Um, so uh, if there are no more questions, um, I think we are good. Um, that ends today's lecture. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Uh, definitely means a lot. Um, I hope you all have a great time in your debate careers and also enjoy. Um, and have a great day. Uh, enjoy and good luck in debate. <laughs> thank you.